background is, but these are like system pumps here. This right here is a domestic hot water tank, storage tanks. Uh, up here is a circulating pump that pushes water to this boiler. So the pipes come down. You see these little arrows here, they go into the boiler, right? Uh, and then there's a, there's a diverting valve here. So these, right where, this, where I've got this, that's a temperature sensor. And when that temperature drops below a certain amount, this valve will divert the water from circulating back to the boiler into the tank, right? Now, if you've never been inside of a building before, uh, what I did was I, I looked at, I, I, I based it off my, my, my bill of material, my contract based off the contract drawings. So I'm gonna give you this example here. So what we were just looking at was the domestic hot water boiler. Here's the take a look at the schematics here I mean if this is your first time looking at something and I mean this can be anything I'm, I'm doing mechanical equipment but if you if you are if you are just learning or you know you're maybe going to be handed this over this is going to be handed over to you and you're in charge of operating it now we can start to to not even just show you what the individual components are but we can start to explain how they work and then where they're physically located Right? So, as Stephen pointed out, this, this would be not just, this is no longer just VR, this is an extended reality, this is an extension of capability, because now I have all the, all the, all the documentation attached to it. So that's, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty good example, a pretty keen example. The other examples that uh, I can show you here, for example, let's go to Man Fun. Let's go into Man Fun. All right, so, so this was done by, you, you shot this, yeah. correct? You, this was your, this is your handiwork. Uh, I love sharing stuff with people because I didn't even realize that if I had, I had Steve as a collaborator on this, uh, I had Steve as a collaborator. So th this is, this is what the, this was the beginning of augmented reality as we know it today, right? So this is the sequential wave and printing machine. Uh, where Steve's like photographing waves, right? Like frequencies, radio waves, uh, various things. Um, and what I did just to kind of, well, this is, and I mean, this is this is so cool. Like, you can kind of see the, the waveform. And so what Steve's doing here, he's teaching, he's teaching, showing, physically showing you what the waveforms are. So then you can you can take that waveform, and then you can take the the mathematics that that support it. And then you can put the two, two together so you can visualize it. Which is funny because that was my whole point in doing Bork was to be able to visualize it so you could say, there's the tank, there's the schematic, right? Same, 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 same thought process. Um, so it's funny how serendipity works. So, and then I just added in here, uh, this, is the, this is the site that kind of describes uh, SWIM in greater detail, right? You can see here, uh, the, uh, so this is like 1974, right? So we're talking about uh, augmented reality with wearable computing more than 40 years ago. And this is at the National Gallery in Ottawa, which I'm actually going to Ottawa this weekend, so it'll be kind of neat to see. Uh, and, and I mean, this is, this. I would need Steve to jump in uh, a little bit on this, on the background on this. Um, yeah, this is MetaVision. These are concepts from 1974. Uh, like meta vision, uh, the vision of vision, sensing sensors and sensing their capacity to sense. And so this is kind of an early form of extended reality or XR, where you extend human senses and overlay things on top of the reality there are 
but not only augment the world but also extend our vision because these are otherwise invisible radio waves that are photographed and you can see them and photograph them on top of the reality in which they're in. So they're perfectly aligned with the reality interactively and you can explore it interactively and that is kind of what extended reality XR is all about. And I think more and more people are realizing that XR is the way to go. You know, it's this generalization that you kind of got VR, AR, and all these different realities, and it kind of encapsulates the realities and extends upon them. And, and what Scott's done is, is sort of created a business model around, so he makes his living uh, in uh, living in extended reality and creating extended reality spaces for companies. So he's a super smart uh, sort of genius guy who gets in there and figures things out, how to make things work. So he'll go into a mechanical room and he'll take all the documentation of the mechanical room, totally take all the building automation stuff and create a virtual world or a extended world, extended reality really, because you can actually be in the mechanical room and annotate things and see them. And so what that means is that when there's a building manager comes in, they can actually go and say, oh, uh, did you do this? Did you do that? And he'll come in there and he'll have everything in there, the full documentation of the building, chilled water pumps, the turn down on the chilled water pumps, everything's in there. And so what he's done is really extended human perception and human sen senses in a way that is practical and allows you to monitor, um, allows you to do building monitoring and building automation. Yes, thanks, excellent. <laughs> Uh, and and I and I, I believe as I as I've started to learn more about the origins and the first principles of augmented reality, extended reality, uh, mixed reality, like I, I actually understanding what the definitions are, I'm I focus on applied technology. So what Steve is what Steve has laid out is like a roadmap that you can now build out applications. Like you can start to focus on. You know, you can see gaps in technology, gaps in areas, and you can start to combine them, right? Um, so, I mean, I, I envision I, I envision mechanical or any technical application where BORP is for cross-functional team collaboration. So you may not be the mechanical person on the job, you may be electrical, you may be the computer science, you may be the building automation, right? So the, I think the 3D modeling, and I think the 3D world, it brings everything together so that you know, you can see all the connections to a machine. Like you can see the electrical connection, you can see the control connections, you can see the piping, everything. Uh, and then, then you can start to break that down by the, by, by the individual, um, uh, you know, whatever your, whatever your technical background or expertise, right? So then, and now he starts to put everyone on the same page, right? And I, and I learned that from doing this process, the submittal process in construction, where I would have to put a document together, list all the technical data, list all the performance data, uh, coordinate with the electrical controls, structural, plumbing, mechanical, like piping, everything, all in one document. And now that I've, and now that I've seen the what the what the potential is with augmented reality, with virtual reality, it's going to eliminate uh, any need to have. Uh, really any paper trails, any paper documentation, right? Like if you think about, if you think about what augmented reality means, uh, and like it's now moving into construction. So what happens uh, in the automotive industry, you have, uh, you have the 3D modeling, which then that 3D modeling, that information from the 3D modeling, I can design my 3D model, gets then converted into like a code, right? Like a G code that a CNC milling machine can then make with precision because it's making it off the direct coordinates. So now that's sort of inside my computer, that's inside my box. Now with augmented reality, now it's outside the box. Now you're projecting the 3D hologram, you're projecting it onto the site and you're building to the exact design, right? So it completely changes the workflow uh, for new construction. A and good way to think of it is uh, we think of scientific instruments like a box with a screen on it, and you plug test equipment, you plug something under test, and you see on the box, you know, you see on, on, on this, this oscilloscope trace or whatever, and I, I call this an outstrument, I guess. It's kind of like, it's a device that, that uh, puts out onto the real world, it spits that back out onto the real world, whatever it is that you're testing or seeing the phenomenon. 
So it's like an oscilloscope, but it throws it right back onto the real world. So you see everything on top of reality rather than on a, uh, inside a box. Yeah, and, and, I, and I mean, for virtual reality, uh, for 3D modeling, uh, 3D capture, for mixed reality, augmented reality, I, I believe we're going to start to see where, you know, where you're going to you're going to have technical information. I, I believe it's going to replace uh, user interface UI. There's going to be no more graphics. Everything that we're going to be utilizing, we're going to sit in our car. We're going to be able to pull all the information, right? So as I said before, if it's like integrating IT, OT, and IoT, so you know you can pull sensor data and be able to visualize it. Like it not just what's limited to your dashboard, right? So not just a sensor going off, but being able to see real-time analytics. Yeah, so, it's like like in the seventies I called it MetaVision, and nowadays people might call it Metaverse. You know, but it's it's a similar you know idea of of, of Meta or beyond. That's right, and I mean now we're looking at everything on a computer screen, but I mean, you know, I. I, I I think in the very near future, things are being developed so that you won't have to pull your computer onto a job site, right? Like you'll be able to just walk into a mechanical room and be able to see live, see live data and then have it uploaded live, right? Uh, I'll give you another kind of example how I use it, uh, which I find um, one of the reasons why I started thinking down this path was because I would go into buildings and I would ask them to I would go into buildings and I would ask for information that I needed to analyze whatever the situation, whatever the whatever the technical complaint was. So I'll just give you a brief example. So one of the things that I do, right, is uh, you know selection and design of these pumps. This is a chiller system. Uh, if we want to bounce out right here. Um, Right now we can sort of see plant layout. So this is there's a there's a cooling tower right here. So you got this sort of dollhouse view of the chiller plant, and then you can come right in and look at any of the things and see all the statistics and documents and manuals and everything associated with it. Yeah. So what it, exactly? So I, what I've done here is I've connected in through submittal data. So the submittal data is important because it has the dimensions, it has the performance, right? So here. Pump curves and all that sort of stuff too, right? Yeah. So Head versus flow. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you, really you can start to. Yeah, and you can start to analyze. So what I would say, first off, uh, I, I just picked a design point. Uh, like this is a 500 ton chiller, uh, and I just picked a design point of 1050 GPM at 30 feet ahead, uh, and then I'm going to go grab my. Here's my curve, so um, here's about 10, right? So 1050. Yeah, about... so if you're 1,050 gallons per minute, your your head, you can look over and see what your, how much feet of how many feet of head there's gonna be at that flow rate. Really, so that, exactly. So that so that's like a nine and a half inch impeller, right? So that, then I can look at the nameplate. So when, when, I have, when I have the virtual layout, when I have the 3D model, and then I have all the technical data all included, then what happens now? I can start to I can start to assess things, and I can say, okay, well, the design head was because pumps deliver they, they create pressure in the system, um, and so the flow is a result of uh, moving from high to low pressure. Uh, but so I would I would focus on the the, the head here, the head pressure. Uh, then I can observe is it is it higher? Is it lower? Is it you know where what is the actual head pressure on here? And if I know that it's a constant speed pump, for instance, and let's say the head pressure is higher, like so, let's say the head's like reading, reading it's um, so what am I at thirty? Let's call it. Let's say it's at thirty-five, whatever the installation, because the energy that we use in buildings is based on. You're saying thirty-five feet of head, right? Yeah, thirty-five feet. Like so, say I'm thirty-five feet, so I'm going to be just roughly. Just under eight hundred there then gallons per minute. Right, so what happens feet. in a constant speed, it, uh, if, if I throttle a valve or something changes, it's going to slide up the curve this way, right? And I'm and now my, so my head, my energy is going up and my flow is going down. Well, that can be a problem, right? So by documenting buildings, uh, what we're doing is we're, we're stating, okay, well, what are the design conditions? Because when we go to commission a building, we commission it per what the engineer has designed the, the building to operate at which means that the 
uh, commission building is that equals design efficiency equals the operating um, uh, the energy or energy it's energy optimized because it's it's operating at its design but when people when things change so I like to use pumps as a great example for for analyzing just st my starting point to analyze what's happening in a building right so flow so now you can see how there was a difference a change in pressure impacted my flow that's across the pumps so now when I go back here the the other the formula here is is delta t in flow is the equals the capacity so if my flow starts to go down what happens to my delta t what happens to my performance of my machines if now all of a sudden my flow is now changed right so there may be a perfectly good reason for it but unless you have the history the full history and, and building owners and facility managers continue to add to the documentation that, that, that happens during construction, where all our buildings are drifting from design. So the whole idea for this is to bring our buildings back into design simply through documentation. Like, That's a good point, though. That's a good frame of reference. We drift away from design. That happens, you gradually creep away from design. And, and everything in, in, a, in an HVAC system, in a building system, in a mechanical room, it has like a cascade effect. So you might have something that's starting over on this side here. It could be the pump, it could be a, if it's a tower, it could be a heat exchanger, you know, and there's, a, there's an additive effect that happens and all of a sudden something's not operating right in, the, in, in another, another area of the system. Well. You know the the knee-jerk reaction is that's what the issue is well it's like no nah, we have to look at again you have to look at the flow you have to look at the pressure the delta pressure you have to look at delta t's trying to understand how design flow impacts how pressure impacts pumps and all that right so uh once you have that all that information once you can organize all that information now you're ready for your service strategy your technology strategy maybe you want to do building automation Maybe you want to maybe you want to just collect data so that you have more information so that you can find out what happens between seasons or summer winter changeovers, right? Before you decide to go and rip something out and put something in. What I'm ultimately what I what I'm what I'm focused on is trying to save the existing equipment and machines that we have, um, as opposed to just running them into the ground, putting in something that's new, uh, and patting ourselves on the back. What I'm trying to do is bring the documentation back up in buildings, get the buildings back into design, and then decide whether or not the new, more efficient uh, equipment is is really going to help us in terms of you know reducing carbon footprint. All right. So that's what it all boils down to. So you know, if you have the ability to access everything remotely from uh, you know from site, where you can have everyone from a team doesn't have to drive to the job site. And then on top of in, embedding in the uh, documentation, so we have all the contract documents, we have all the performance information. Now we can start to embed in now building automation, right? We can start to embed in other information. So I can, I can then connect that too, and then we can look at them side by side, right? Um, and, that, and that is kind of, uh, that's it in a nutshell. Um, you know, I think that this, uh, the future for computer science, and I think the future for mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, all, all, all facets are, are, they're all gonna converge in this, in this metaverse or this virtual reality. Uh, and I think it's gonna, it's gonna happen, it's gonna, it's happening. Like it's starting to, it's hit, I think it's hitting that tipping point where people are starting to realize the value of it, right? So being able to develop, uh, you know, applications, that interact with that, being able to be multi-disciplinary, uh, um, you know, being able to flex in mechanical, and being able to look into, you know, trying to find other ways and better ways to do things and change the workflow, current workflow. I think that's uh, that's the future. So, yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So, do you guys do you like? Because like for the, I don't know if usual building system happens, right? But like. A lot of those uh, mechanical systems now have embedded like uh, IoT sensors into them that do have you know sort of traces of data and you know more data history like pressure or something. I don't know in some factory system they do have. I don't know normal building would have them or not. Maybe it's too expensive. 
But do you, have you considered integrating that maybe into the whole virtual reality thing? A hundred percent, absolutely. So anything with the compressor, uh, anything that's like anything with the compressor is going to come like VRF, ver uh, variable recursion volume, chillers. Uh, they're going to come with the microprocessors already embedded and pre-wired and factory wired because they're they're managing the vapor compression cycle. Right, so they're managing also the health of the, the health of the compressor, uh, and the safe, the safe and efficient operation of the machine, right? Uh, that uses uh, refrigeration, the refrigeration cycle. So all of the all of that information is embedded in there. What uh, we have uh, in construction is a protocol, standardized protocol called BACnet, uh, and BACnet is so it's for the interoperability between various technologies. So you have uh, the, the chiller comes with its own, its own programming and its its own its own uh, back end, like before the user interface, uh, and then it has the ability to pull out the details, like say like pressure and temperature, whatever the whatever the whatever the relevant details are, outside the box that the user needs to understand and to be able to analyze. Those are available in a in a protocol, a standardized protocol called BACnet. So. Uh, there, there are other objects, um, and then there's different controls. Uh, there's different control strategies. There's actually BACnet, Modbus, Lawnworks, N2, but BACnet seems to be the one that's really kind of taking off. Uh, and so, basically, I can have five different manufacturers from anywhere across anywhere in the world, and we put them in one mechanical room, and then we get the building automation and everybody's talking back net, right? So if I have a, if I have a rooftop of one from one manufacturer and I have a different type of air handling from another manufacturer and they both have supplier temperature sensors, well, if I want to know what the supplier temperature, I go through the back net object list and I say that back net object equals this supplier temp, right? So then the building automation will then pull, the, pull that information and then load that into their system. And then there's read and write. There's read and write uh, points. There's read only points, right? So there's some objects that you can manipulate. There's some that are just for data points, right? Uh, and then they go into a graphic user interface, right? So they'll show like you know the pipe, and they'll show the pump, a little graphic. They'll show the spinning when it's on, right? My, I I I believe that that's going to change. That the way that we that we view machines is going to change. The graphics. I, I don't know, I don't see, I, I mean, graphics will always be a function, but I think the, the graphics will be definitely integrated in with the 3D modeling, right? So you'll be able to look at a pane, you'll be able to walk into a mechanical room, you'll see all the, all the critical data points, whether you're using some sort of eyeglass that you, know, that you, can, like, that you can visualize it, um, or, you're, or you're just physically looking at the space, because even, even even graphics, right? When you when you put things in three D, we all think in three D, right? Like everything, all, we all kind of process information the same, right? We all see these chairs. We all know that we are. We all agree that they're going to be the same size. We all agree that they're the same color, right? I don't make chairs. I, I don't do anything about chairs. Neither do you. But that's what we can see, and that's the, where the power is. That's where the power in three D is, right? Then you can physically see it. And we can all agree on. Yeah, okay, that's what it is. And make me think like the, the pressure chart, this like flow versus pressure chart sort of. Like yeah. It's three dimensional chart in essence. Is that correct? Because it has those. Oh, because I mean, you've got horsepower. Yes. It's, it's, it's sort of like a three dimensional. If you, I think you can plot this in MATLAB and get like a three dimensional plot of this. Well, I mean, interesting that you're saying that. I mean, one of the things that. I mean, I I can't do anything without the without the pump curves. I mean, I can't. I mean, I, I, I you walk into a mechanical room and they're saying, "Well, you're you have an issue," and I said, "Okay, well, I need the submittal data. <clears throat> I need the design documents to know, okay, wh what was I supposed to be at? Then I need the commissioning documents to know, well, where did we end up? And then I need and then I need the submittal data to know where to know where we're at. And then and then I need to be able to visually observe." The pressure gauges in the in the room, if I don't have that information already pulled up into the cloud into building automation, right? So, 
Yeah, I mean, having having this information almost standardized, like so that, like you're saying, like you know, when people can see in 3D, it does take a little bit of practice to work your way around the pump curve, you know, and if uh, if you can kind of show that in 3D, right? Like if you understand, you know, not everyone's going to want to sit around and, and listen to pump affinity laws, right? Or take the time to learn about them. But I like your, I like what you're, I like what you're thinking. Like if it's in 3D and you can visually see it, oh, here's my values, here's my horsepower, here's, here's what's happening to my amps, here's what's happening to my GPM, here's what's happening to the, the differential pressure in the system, right? And you can just see that 3D. That would be, that would be great. Yeah. You know, it just like the, I mean, maybe, it, maybe it doesn't really apply to this chart in particular, but I think more thinking like any sort of graph where you have like sort of like a topological like uh, equal line to those type of like graphs you know that sometimes traditional engineering there a lot of those graphs it's like they just have the lines to mark the altitude and you have to look at a 2d graph and then you have to look at like a three hidden like a third hidden dimension that's mm. just labeled right yeah and they just they're always not intuitive. I mean, because I'm a recent graduate of engineering student, so they were, I can simply remember, they're not intuitive to learn because yeah. it's hard to grasp the meaning behind the label lines and numbers, right? Mm -hmm. You can't have a 3D graph representation of those naturally. I think that would be. We did this thing called Head Games, which is a virtual reality VR extended reality experience that teaches principles of head. This kind of turns it into a video game. Turns pump curves into a game. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. That's cool. We called it head games. Head games. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> yeah, I love I love pumps. Yeah, I've, I've yeah. worked on all I've worked on lots of. Uh... But you might like that. You know, we turn we gamify the the three D uh, like turn that into a three dimensional gamified experience. Yeah. Or you know, because you, your third dimension could be that other. See this plurality of curves here, eight yeah. inch, eight and a half. That could be your third dimension in there, for example. So I, I think also, I think also I was asking Steve about you know being able to actually see, um, being being able to see the performance on the, from the electrical side outside of an electric motor, like would you actually be able to see, like what would you what would, what can we see like would we be able to visually, you know visualize um, the electric uh, electro, electromagnetic field around a motor? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that would have a certain like magnitude, right? You've like, seen the thing that shows the motor field, right, spinning? That you've done? Yeah. No, I haven't seen it. Oh, okay. I'll pull it out and and and, and show you guys for the benefit yeah. of anyone who hasn't seen it. I, I mean, that that would be another way of you know, if I didn't have any of my curves, uh, if there would be another system of being able to visualize that. Yeah, right? for a VFD or something like that. You know, you VFD or or just you can see what the work of the motor, right? So watch the motor doing its job. Watch it doing its job. That's right. Instead of getting all like olden days and uh, reading uh, pump curves and stuff, like <laughs> that, right? But uh, yeah, but I mean, just be, having the ability to put the, the practical and the uh, you know the practical uh, and the uh, theory side by side, right? So you know, right here, this is a triple duty valve. So it basically it's more than three inch, by the way, but. Um, so, so basically, it's like a balancing valve, a check valve, uh, missing. I forget the third one. Anyways, it's late in the day. But you know, if if all of a sudden someone comes in, modifies a flow this, valve, a flow control valve, probably is the third thing. Right? Uh, yeah, balancing. Yeah, balancing a check valve. Oh, an isolation valve. Oh, yeah, yeah, that yeah. was the third one. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so they're yeah right here. So somebody's gone and they've taken a wrench to that, <laughs> and then all of a sudden now my energy is going through the roof, right? So you know it's it's interesting. You can compare, um, you know, you can you can look at these curves. Let me just go back over right here. You know, you can start to you can start to calculate. Like there's software that you can um, you can plug that selection software where it'll actually tell you what your amps are at various at various um, flow and heads. Actually, I should probably pull one up for fun if you want. But that was what did I say 1050 at 30 feet. Yeah. Yeah.
It's pretty good to search it on the fly here. <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah. Keep on sizing, I don't want that. Maybe this is it. Alright. Oh yeah, here we go. So we'll just do like a little selection here. Commercial pumps. Uh, no. This is how you choose a pump. You know, if you're doing this is how you do it, yeah. Back here. Yeah, exactly. So that was ten fifty. Typical system flow. Typical yeah. head. I just did the one pump, that's all that was there. I don't know if they're going to give me my old uh, selection here. No results. Okay, so this is older. So this was an 888. Eight, eight. It didn't give me the. Oh, that's an 8 and 10. Yeah, so that was an 8 and 10 that I was using. This is running at constant volume, right? So you can sort of see motor capability rated, motor design. Uh, so your brake horsepower is the actual work that's happening. So that's uh, the positive suction heads. You don't want to drop below there, you'll cavitate your pump. But that's 9.4 horsepower. Uh, it was a 15 horsepower pump that's there. So you can you can convert that to kilowatts, right? And then you can convert to kilowatt hours, and then it's just like a light bulb. It's an electric motor, right? So you can convert that, and then you can go whatever eight thousand hours in the year if it's running. Now it's a chiller, so it's not. But you can start to see in buildings where, from electrical side, you see now you see the mechanical and electrical all the kind of impact, and then how controls can impact that. And one, we, the idea is we want to stay within. Uh, you want to stay within design here, so let me. Especially that cavitation too, right? You you, you know you want to not uh, destroy the pump like. That would be more like somebody coming along and throttling a valve on the suction side. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You know that sudden change in pressure, and then what happens then when they? So basically, basically you get all these bubbles that appear, right? And when they float the vapor, and then when they come back, they they could explode. So you can actually blow your pump up. Right? But. Uh, the water boils, basically, you know, under when you... The pressure yeah. is too low. Yeah. yeah, when the pressure is too low. Exactly. So now I'm just going to go over here and say, well, if somebody throttled that valve. That was 9.4, right? Yeah. Let's see what that does. Let's see what that does. Mm, 10.99 horsepower, right? So now you can start to see... You know, just slight changes uh, onto electrical, right? So, so there you go. So, just some things that you sort of want to look for. So now, when you're in the mechanical room, you're like saying to yourself, "Well, uh, and that's a great selection." So the best efficiency, you can see the efficiency curves are right here, the 82, 83. Right? Yeah, you can see where it comes really good. The sweet spots in there. Uh, yeah. Right so, in around here. Right? I can almost imagine a 3D shape of the efficiency right, versus the other curves. It's like a slope, right? It's going down that direction, or it's not going to bounce. So that's the system curve. So that represents the actual friction yeah. uh, at the given flow. Mm -hmm. That's reality. This would be the control curve, right? Yeah. So this control curve, uh, they're giving me a control curve, 32 feet. This is a sensorless pump. So what they've done, uh, so Armstrong has done something really cool, was they had, um, so in a traditional system, we have constant flow, which is what I just showed you, which is just gonna push water through when it's on, right? When the chiller wants to come on, it turns, it cycles the pump on. Then you have variable flow systems, right? Which 90% uh, of the time, they operate like 60% of their design, right? They don't operate at their full design or the full load or the full flow, uh, so then, so then, and, and the way the way that we get our turn down here, so right here at this point, this 35 that we've got here, that would be that would be if the system is wide open, right? Like everything is open, 
everything's calling, the system is, that's, that's the design flow or the design head, yeah. right? So when, I, when they put this 32 hertz down here, because the hertz, hertz equals RPM equals the, the pump diameter, right? So if it's synchronous. Hmm? If it's synchronous, if there's no slip. Yeah. Yeah. For, yeah. for well, I would have to read up on that more. But, um, for Approximately, the, like if it's a right. squirrel cage more, there might be a slight little bit of slip. So the, the RPM might be a little less than the hertz, just slightly less. But not, but it'll be, it'll be close. So, but for the pump affinity laws, when you're trying to calculate stuff, like if you're looking at a VFD and you see the hertz up on the, on the drive or on the, on the wall, you can kind of start to say, okay, where, where's my... Yeah, yeah, you can get the RPM. So now, the reason why the post is hertz on this is because they're integrated pumps. So I guess the, the first, the way of doing it was then to put the sensor out at the furthest part of the system so that everything closed, that furthest piece of equipment would get its design flow. Right, because as everything closes, the head pressure goes up. So then the pump goes up. The pressure differential pressure is going high. So I'm going to slow down. And where this is located here, this is supposed to be the furthest point of the uh, furthest point of the system to main design flow okay. at the furthest piece of equipment, right? Which the water balancer gives you. So if we go up here, uh, let's say, let's say. So that, that's a proper that's properly set up with the balancer and the controls contractor. But if you just put the you put the sensor in the mechanical room, now you're almost at the design head because you're close to the you you can't have you, you're measuring the lowest pressure or the highest pressure point is closest to across the pump, yeah. right? So you can't meet the full flow and meet the minimum flow. It doesn't know because the sensor is too close to the pump, right? So there's a bunch of different uh, strategies. Um, variable frequency drives, uh, now that they're integrated, I, I worked for this company for like four years. They're a great company. They've innovated sensorless technology, so they're saying no more sensor. Um, and what they're doing is they're mapping the power and the speed to the flow in the head. So then if I were to order this exact pump, that pump would then go on a test stand and then they would map, they would download their software, map it in, Right? But you still need to talk to the balancer, you still need to work with the controller. Really running an open loop, I guess, and hoping that, that it'll match the... No, I, for, cl uh, for closed. For, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, for, um, yeah. Yeah, I wasn't thinking something this detailed. It's going to be saying, like, the, the efficiency curves, right? Mm -hmm. You can see it goes from 70 to 80, and then I, I assume they are equal line, right? So basically, mm -hmm. like, between the... Well, they, they just mean like the, the level, right? So you can make a 3D shape out of the efficiency lines. Yeah. Right? And you look at how efficiency they increase in the middle and then it, it drops as it comes together and you can then change sort of. Yeah. I, I mean, efficiency lines. Mm. But it seems to be fairly uniformly. Well, even if it's not, right, you can make it uh, like pop out of the screen, you know, when it's like 85, it's like a peak, it's like higher. When it's I think what you're saying is you want to do a 3D visualization of this, yeah. say, like get yeah. a third dimension there, which could be, for example, you could see it all, like right now there's this family of curves, mm -hmm. but you could probably in 3D, you could see that all as a single surface, maybe for the different frequency hertz continuously coming out of the page, let's say. You could do that. That yes. might be kind because of right now the, the efficiency is sort of like, you know, it's a step function almost. If you just look at it, it's like you don't really know how between 71 and 76 is what's going on there. You don't really know, right? It's just a equal line. But if you have this like all 3D visualization of it that popped out, you could see, oh, there is probably sort of like increment between 71 and 76 there. Right? It's like a smooth. We need if you so, could try that. If you could, if you could do a VR, because do you have, you have a VR headset, right? So you could probably put that pump, we could take a pump, like we one of my hydrolophone pumps, yeah. and we could generate the curves for it. Because what, what we do is we, uh, we take the pump and put it in the fountain. I, I do this with the kids, you know, just for fun, just to teach uh, yeah. head versus flow head games. Just put the pump in there and raise it up gradually and measure how much water comes out over time and plot the whole thing out and generate all the data. We can even, we can even make a little robot that goes through all possible amounts of head and flow yeah. and and gets all the data and measures put current sensors on it and everything collect all that data and then throw it into a, 
uh, VR world with your uh, with the eyeglasses and, and explore the pump curves in in, mm. uh, in VR 3D. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be fun. That'd be a fun little research project. You know, we could probably write a paper on that. And you, uh, you, you, you plus Scott and I, the three of us, could probably, and anyone else who wants to join, could write a paper on uh, using extended reality to understand both for teaching head games, you know, gamification of pump flow curves, and also for research. Like if you walked into a mechanical room or a chiller plant and you could look at the pump and see overlaid on it exactly what's going on is exactly. a 3D model. Like you could see that live, that curve is a 3D live pop-out right on the pump, dynamically showing what's happening in the pump. Uh, in real time. In real time. Right. That would be, that'd be a good publication. It would be useful. I think building managers would really like it. Yeah, they'd be able to say, hey, what's going on, right? And you could almost, yeah, that would be, uh, I mean, I think, I think that's one of the things I was asking you about, uh, like, would be cool to see fluid flow through pipe. Yeah. Right? Yeah, if you could see, like, 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 uh, like all of the, you know, the parabolic velocity profile um across the pipe flow you could see that you could see fluid flowing in the virtual um it's really fascinating today you know down by ontario place at the trillium park entrance i was there yeah. and i saw a three-phase water pump 600 volt three-phase water pump being installed uh in the stormwater retention basin and they had a big crane lifting it in i thought wow that's really neat so i got talking to all those guys they had about 20 people there it was super yeah. awesome they had uh, you learn a lot by just looking at what pumps are happening in the world around you. Yeah. I just happened to be riding my bike by there and I started, you know, kind of hung out there for a while, learned a little bit from those guys. And uh, you can learn a lot by just, from just people who work in the industry. Yeah, just uh, by doing stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. Just figured out. Yeah, because not everybody knows everything, but each person has their own little area of expertise. And if you put all these pieces together, you can start to learn what's happening in the world. Yeah, I th and, I, and I think like we're you know we're talking about we're talking about pumps, we're talking about horsepower, we're talking about energy, you know, we're talking about the impact of uh, you know the change in head and the change in, in horsepower. But really, it's about pipes. It's about the it's it's about pipe design. Does it say anything about the motor on that? Is six hundred volt or two hundred eight? Does it's it? Uh, Five seventy five. Oh, okay. So the six hundred volt system then, I guess. Yeah, you can change. I can change it. Yeah. Uh, I'll just say here, my options. You could probably put a two hundred eight in there. Our building's two hundred eight volt three phase. So. Let's see, what, see what happens. These are the RPM curves. This is the control curve. This is the system curve. Yeah. So by putting the sensor further away from the pump, you're more more getting the turn down, you're more, more following the true line of the system curve. If you put the, if you put the sensor here, you're almost like just getting, that's the savings that you're getting. So all the energy savings comes from, so flow changes directly with the change in diameter or change in RPM or the change in Hertz. And then um, horsepower changes to the cube of the change in RPM. Uh, and, uh, Head changes to the to the square of the change of RPM or diameter. Um, Head is proportional to the square of the RPM. Yes. Is that very much it? These no. are just, those are tools to calculate just kind of like what your, you know, what your time period is when you're using it, you know, your time of day costs, right? So you kind of need if you could virtualize all that in VR, right? If you had this extended human, well, if, superhuman capability to walk into a mechanical room and have a little a catalog of all the available pumps, and you could kind of see what they would all do one at a time or go through them, right? Well, this is, uh, and, and also to track in real time. So yeah, to track yeah. what, what's installed what's happening and what's the future of it, right? So we talk about future proofing in buildings, right? So the only way to really do that is by, like, look at, so how many different references now have we gone through, right? Um, 
So it'd be really cool if we could just take all this information and just have it all nice and neatly overlaid in here. Even get rid of these tags, right? We can just have actual system values. Pull all the backnet points, pull everything into here. All the, all the, all the microprocessor information, all the building automation inf information, and then just, and then just have it open, right? Yeah, so, be cool. Be neat if you could see through that and look inside there in virtual reality too, right? Watch what's happening phase coherently, because if you look at the, the the electrical signal, if it were synchronous, you could see where the exactly where it was and slow it down and and actually look in the coordinates of the spinning uh, rotating magnetic field and see the the phase like see the lag the phase lag of the uh, impeller that's what i was and that's and that's what i was asking if we could do that so yeah that'd be so much fun that would be right yeah like to yeah. be able to to be able to walk in and physically physically see have superhuman x-ray vision and literally be able to see into everything and not and you, totally understand how it's what's going on because that would happen inside of this box right inside yeah. this casing yeah yeah you'd be able to see that you so. see right through that casing and you could put yourself in coordinates that's rotating you know like this thing's rotating mm -hmm. really fast you yeah. could put yourself in the coordinates as if you're an ant standing on the impeller spinning around with it uh -huh. and see its phase relationship to the rotating magnetic field and then you think about like that so not just for that application but just also engineering practices right and developing tech right i'll show you guys my motor thing mm -hmm. as well too yeah. um at some point in time when, when, he, when you're finished with it yeah, no, I think that that's kind of like the, that's kind of like the, the general, the kind of the overview, right? So, um, I mean, it's just having information, having it at your fingertips, being able to see things in 3D, being able to, you know, being able to like, you know, hey, we're, we, we all know what the chair is, even though we, none of us are, are in manufacturing the chairs, but we all agree, you know, we can all agree on what the physical uh, lay of condition of something is, right? Um, you know, before we go and make a, a choice, you know, because we're, we're trying to achieve something, we're trying to achieve energy efficiency, let's work this out and put another pump in that's more energy efficient. Well, well hold on. Where are we? We need to know where we're, like, what can we do to fix this or optimize it, right? So, that's it. Thanks Beautiful. Much, yeah. Okay, a big round of applause for our, for our guest here. Thanks. And, did, uh, did you have a question? So I was thinking, so let's say we have a 3D model of this machine. Yes. Uh, so what, uh, how is it, how is using VR here any different from uh, walking inside that 3D model on the computer and not physically going there, but still having the documentation and curve renderings and all the, uh, pump calculations available for you. So it would be still available in a 3D simulation. So on a computer, you, you can walk with arrow keys instead of going there. So well, what's the difference with v between seeing it in VR uh, versus that? Okay, cool. Uh, that's a great question, actually. Uh, so, so now if, uh, the difference would be if, if the VR model is not documented, uh, you would save a gas a tank of gas, right? Maybe an afternoon because you can visually look at it. And right now, if it's fully documented, uh, most of these mechanical rooms, the documentation is lost. Like there's not, there's no, there's no documentation. Uh, everything is all set in silos. Uh, even companies and people within organizations are all operate within silos. They just have different metrics, right? So the accounting department, uh, the building operator. Um, so the the idea of doing it is more for like a cross-functional team, teamwork, so that everyone can virtually go in and and see the documentation and and be, get on the same page. It's very hard to get uh, multiple people from one organization or different organizations all there on the same day and have all the all the information they need. I've spent so many of my so much of my time going to job sites and asking for information, and it's it's just not there, and they don't even know why they need that information, right? <laughs> so the, it's like the, and so and so what I what I'm what I'm saying what I'm what I'm talking to customers is I'm saying, it's it's continuous documentation, continuous training of your documentation, 
that leads to your continuous continuous commissioning or to keep in the commission state right so if I have all so when I so when I'm bidding on a job I read the plans the specs and the schedules I read them in conjunction with one another I understand what the nuance is so if there's contradictions you kind of understand well what's the application and then so then you then you say okay well I know that they need low ambient on this chiller because it's going to be serving a gymnasium inside of a school and it's going to get hot in the winter so I know that they're going to need they're going to need mechanical cooling right so it doesn't say that but I know that it's serving a gymnasium I'm looking at the plans and I'm saying it's inside the building right so then so then so then I put a I put a bid together I bid it then I do all the submittals it gets approved it gets shipped it gets built uh, then we start doing the commissioning process we start getting it ready. so they, there's a factory startup it's called fat factory applied startup or, or I can't remember it's called fat but uh, so they, they, they factory test it right and then and then I'm and then I send technicians down to site and then they they, they do they do the startup with uh, with the under under the supervision of the mechanical engineer the mechanical contractor the water balancer the controls contractor um, the, did I say testing and balancing contract yet um, and and then so we all work in concert with one another we bring this building to design it's a lot of work and it's a it's it's a cross-functional team then we hand it over to the owner and the owner doesn't have that team set up the, the owner doesn't have the that depth of the construction team no building does no building's got a water balancer and the controls people just hanging out they usually have a facility person that calls the service company <clears throat> to come to the job to come and 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 respond to something that's not working when we should be proactively managing and building our tech and building our service strategies around the documentation that was delivered to them delivered at, at, at the time of building occupancy or at the time that the building was commissioned and approved as commissioned right because it all I have to do is just go and touch this little valve here this little guy right here that, that little thing the little that little needle like just get my wrench on that and this thing can start running really hot like you, once you start, then you start understanding like the vapor compression cycle, right? So if it is throttled, why was it throttled like that? I don't know. Like why, who did it? Did it happen during commissioning? Or why I need to see the documents? Is this not the basis of design equipment? Oh, okay, is that the reason why it's different than what's in the design documents? Like, so the performance data that's in the design documents, now I need to see the commissioning and the startup reports. So you can't just ask, yeah, it's, so it's like a, it, it's like this organic thing that you have to, right? And that's a lot of documentation. And you, you're not, you, I, you can walk it, you can walk through this mechanical room, right? You can take a peel through it, and you're like, mm, no documents behind those barrels, <laughs> right? You'll find, you'll find some documents. You'll find. I'll, I'll show you an example over here. Okay, so this is a cooling tower. Right, so that was the condenser barrel. So that pump is pumping that water through this tower. This is the water treatment here, right? We're gonna come over down here. These are system pumps. Okay, so they've got, they've got a base mounted pump. That's a vertical inline pump. That's an expansion tank. So expansion tank is what they use. There's control air devices and closed loop systems. So they're, they're what their interface between the closed loop and the atmosphere, right? So, and they're also there for like the expansion of fluid when it's heated, right? When it heats and cools, so there's the room for that. So, this is this is the thing where, like if I, if I remember correctly. There's a breaker panel, 600 oh. volts, I guess. Uh, that's, that's a or, PFD with a oh. bypass. This is a starter panel of some, yeah. some description. So this is just a, probably across the line. But you see this kind of stuff, this is how buildings are documented, right? Just writing on. I see a lot of on, that where people write on, on cardboard. Things. Yeah, that's how they're. That's it, right? So this <laughs> is this is what I'm. This is what I'm doing, right? This is what I'm. What you I'm see doing. a lot of that because people want to write something down and they don't have paper, so they grab a, they tear the edge off a box. Yeah. So BORP means building operations resource platform, and by building I mean continuous, right? And I by and I mean by integrating in whatever you got, let's throw it on there. So any cloud, anything in the cloud. Right? I mean, it could be on your local computer, who cares? 
if you want to like tight net security, like no, the, the best cyber security is no internet, right? Just, so there are buildings that do that, where you have to go to site, and, you know, to actually physically put in your CAT6 and then log in and view what's happening, um, right? So these are domestic, these are domestic heater tanks, right? There's another expansion tank, what did I put on there? An SME tank, right? This is just a quick, this is just a quick example. I think that was domestic. We got boilers here, right? Engineered air. So they put their tags and they write on they write on there when they were serviced, but it's disconnected from the rest of the. It's disconnected. So if you go and talk to the if you go talk to the facilities person, and you say what was the last date? So what happens? The service company comes in, they do their service work, they send their invoice and their work report to the head office. Head office sends it back to the facilities. Facility says. <clears throat> Oh, I don't know. Let me go up to my mechanic room and make sure that they signed off on that date that matches my invoice. That's like 2022, right now. <laughs> yeah. And that's and that's a that's a that's a that's a prop that's a that's a good company that's doing that because they actually have a process in place, <clears throat> right? You know, if you walk over if you walk over here, there's another tag, right? So there's a tag with uh, that information that says that, that this was serviced. Because this is a base mounted pump, and it's got it's got bearings that need to be greased, or you know, it's it's so you know, there's there's service work that that needs to be done on it, right? So now combining all that information, right? If we com if we can combine all that information into virtual reality, wouldn't that just be better? You know, now you can start to have, you, we can start to manage our buildings differently, right? But then, like, I'm um, just wondering if, uh, can you build, a, like, for example, like, in addition to virtual reality, maybe you can just have, like, a QR code on other parts, and just scan the QR code, and then they pull up the history, and then you can add it. And add it. They're, they're doing it. They, it's hot. So, there's tons of technology. People are coming in with dashboards, analytics. They're coming in with, like, they're saying IoT, and they say, hey, we'll monitor this, we'll do this, we'll do this. And we'll, you know, we'll give you your analytics, and we'll, we'll, we'll help monitor your building and that. Where, really, what the what, what needs to happen in conjunction with that, they need to read the pump curves. <laughs> they do. They have to look at them. They have to look at them, and that that information needs to be there. So, you know, if if okay, you can do do your IoT strategy. Like, just do some IoT stuff. Perfect. Like, let's go in and. Um, so normally this pressure gauge that's right here is sitting right here and there's one sitting here there is the other one that's on the floor right so you know it's hard to, you can take a lot of another the other to your question about what the difference going to site versus having in VR one of the reasons why I started looking at this what that got me into it um, aside from the documentation missing was that when I looked at five buildings and it was like three hours away and I wish I had taken just four more 2D pictures because yeah, I was looking for a valve that wasn't there but I was in the wrong building I was like because I was looking for a summer winter changeover like so when it goes switches from the boiler heating into chiller cooling but then I was like oh wait after like an hour of like scratching my head right because I was putting something together uh, I realized that it was heating only in the building so there's no air conditioning in the building. There was no, yeah, there was no. So uh, I think most people are just saying uh, IoT lens. Rather than like when you're entering this, for example, this service history, maintenance history, right? You have to sort of go into this passport app and sort of put in the label, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that can be a lot of work for you know, somebody who's not familiar with the technology, right? They have to have the access to metaport and have their account. And, going to use this technology and can be a lot of difficulty for a lot of the people in the industry from just imagine, right? Um, not all everybody might be well worse with technology. And just having I think like a QR code out there so that when they scan it they can just easily, you know, like input information and it'll be synced to this maybe or you know like API and it is an easier way to access it, right? Because all you need to do is scan it. Right? You know, so that's a good question. Do you, are you talking about scanning it on site? 
Yeah, so I was... Like yeah. when you're, like you're physically, when you're, when you're, you're like physically servicing, unsafe. Right? When you're servicing yeah. for like, I service this pump, right? Now mm -hmm. I'm done, so what not, what went up, right? Yeah. So do I have to go to Matterport and like find this, exact pump through like the Matterport yeah. interface and then I click on this pump and then I edit, oh, I have service. This is a lot of work, <laughs> right? Yeah. So if I have, if I, from a building manager perspective, you could say like, uh, as a building manager, this document of like I have this pump or not, I, I give a QR code, it's just from a serial number or not, and I just stick that on there, right? Yeah. And then when I've done servicing, like the maintenance director can just like, oh, I just scan this QR code now, they pop me like, sort of like, you know, a sheet, like a sheet or something that I, you know, just add a new entry, oh, yes. I have serviced this. Yes. And I click enter and you know, they just send the data to Matterport and up this, this right? Yes. That, that would be like a lot easier to do. Yes, you know? I love it. And that's actually, that's perfect. So, so we talked about workflow. So, so Burp is a, just a workflow that, that's using the 3D modeling. So when you're on site, you've got to have, you've got the work to do, right? So one of the things that I've done is I showed you like where I had all my documentation. You can take that same QR coding that you scan on site and you can have it uploaded yeah. and saved to the cloud, which you can access multiple ways, yeah. right? So, so the QR code, right? So when I say IT, IOT, and OT, OT is building automation. So you can attach a building automation to virtual reality. Uh, you can make it like this, or you can, and I'm, I'm not a Matterport sales person. Like I just happened to, use, I just bought Matterport, <laughs> but I mean, well, I sent out two uh, f free open source alternatives to Matterport. Maybe we should all explore those. Yeah. And uh, the other thing I want to do also, t you have your eyeglass, your eyeglass here too. Maybe you want to pass that around, let everybody see this Matterport model, like of the beach, for example. Mm. Yeah. Give everybody a chance to experience the beach. I have my eyes. And you've got yours as well. So maybe you could bring, uh, show the beach and, and let everybody kind of be careful when you're walking around you don't bump into chairs and tables oh, so you just the don't smash the screen yeah don't smash into something but you want you just carefully move around yeah just a few steps you don't need to run the whole beach the beach you don't is, need to uh, you don't meters. need to run all the way down to the end of the beach and smash into this wall because you forget that you're not at the <laughs> beach right you're in this room here <laughs> so but yes um no i like it actually the qr code things uh that's that's a great idea and that's what I mean by integrating it in. You're just using it as, so I did five buildings at once uh, where I had to upgrade the building automation and project manage. So instead of me going into my file explorer, like I've been doing my whole career, go to my file explorer, go to the project folder, go to the project 231, and then going and grabbing the folder, I just mapped it into the virtual reality. So I always had the context, I always had the 3D, because you're doing five buildings, they're all, they're all similar. So now I have the visual reference to it, and it just answers quick. And then you do owner training with it. You show the owners, here's what we delivered, here's what we installed. They have questions. It just makes it, seriously, it's just more convenient. Like it's just, it's super convenient to be able to, to, to so it's like I'm filing in 3D. So you, know, you wanna throw your QR program in, let's throw it in. And it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if it's by the so yeah, get, let's let's go. That's that. Yeah, that was a good presentation. Oh, thanks. I will, yeah. I will quickly connect it. Yeah, connect it to the beach, and then let Scott give it a try. Pass it around, and then uh, and then he can. We'll give a brief uh, summary yeah. of the state of VR. And then the other thing we can do is you got the beach in there. We should we could also put the one of the swim, the one of the waveform, and the oscilloscope in there, and also experience that in the VR headset. Perhaps. Yeah. That'd be cool. Oh, I'm excited to try this. Actually, Prof, uh, I just realized we should like put more photos in the uh, in our workshop. Oh, did we not take enough pictures? Yeah, because now we only take like one side of the workshop. So actually, like <laughs> the model is not complete. This 3D is like only half of it. So, so you can see the waveform from either side, right? You can walk around uh, the waveform. Basically for the wave. Oh, is that what you're looking at now? Are you looking at the beach or are you looking at the waveform? Uh, no, like I'm talking to you. I'm looking at you, this room. Oh, what's that? Uh, what are you looking on the screen now? You. Oh, okay, so you don't have to, you're not. But you can see through it when it's not on? Yeah, but this version, this generation is black and uh, people just released its new generation and uh, it's, uh, cool. color, it's colorful this room.
Uh, not right now. Now I'm into the system. Um, anybody? Oh yeah. You want to try? It? Try. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, it's pretty big. Okay. Can you see it? Yeah. Oh man. Okay. Doesn't it make you want to go for a swim right now? Yeah, a little bit. I don't think yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna just see how far I can walk here. Let's go. I'm quite sure it'll be too Good. far <laughs> before you smash into the wall. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's the oh, there's the swimmer here. Oh, you can see someone there, right? Yeah, yeah. They're paddled, the husband and wife paddling and swimming. Oh, yeah. At 6 a.m. Oh, nice sunrise. Yeah, it's a beautiful morning, isn't it, right now? Yeah, it's gorgeous. <laughs> There's a goose. There you go. Wow. That's pretty neat. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So give everyone a chance to try and experience ah. the beach. Uh, if you can put the other model on the, one of the other glass, oh, too, right? Is this uh, the beach also? This is the feature also. Okay, yeah. Oh, did you guys want to do a mechanical work? Um, oh, do you have the matter for the link? Yeah. Uh, ask me, uh, the link. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, do you want to take that? Um, do you want to take a link? Uh, public. Copy link. Then, after this, this boundary, the bottom line will be further. Do you want to email it to you? Uh, sure. Yeah, you have the email for uh, for uh, the email thread we've, we've got going. Just maybe oh, yeah. email it yeah. to uh, that give Tim and. Uh, you got the beach on there? Uh, yeah. Uh, or are you going to put the mechanical room on there? I'm doing that. So he just sent the link to you guys by email. Yeah. And then Scott, you'll enjoy Ken's presentation because he's going to present a little bit on the state yeah, of the okay. art. I'm going to put this away. This is, I guess, been over the you could, you, you could show the camera briefly how it works, maybe. Yeah, so if anyone is curious, should we? Should I pull? I'll pull this out for a second so you can yeah. get by. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. And then you could just well, show how it works. Wi through Wi-Fi. Oh, this looks good. Yeah. Which did you get the, the mechanical yet? No, I will. Oh, this. Show yeah. Show the camera yeah. presentation first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. Let you try it too. So it's working? Yeah, yeah. I have to work my oh, iPad's like kind of slow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So this connects with uh, Wi-Fi, so there's no viewing screen or anything on here. Um, oh, so there's a view app. Everybody have a chance to see the beach? Capture.
Toronto's only sandless beach. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of see, so that so you can sort of see like a grid set up. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Right? So the the controls are from your from your uh, iPad or your iPhone or whatever. Uh, it's connected through Wi-Fi. Um, so it's going to shoot at infrared, so don't. You don't have to stare right at it. Stare at it when it's like facing the other way. I'm sure, it's fine, but. You can see how it rotates. So you can track it. I usually walk behind it so that I'm always out, out of it. That's how you can be in a big open area. Here. There it is. Here we go. The first scan. All right, so it's the first scan. So then what, what, what you do is you move it a little bit further. Uh, it does a little as well, so that's how it knows that. Uh, it uses like a, like a near infrared lidar. Yeah. Like this, yeah. That's what you, just, uh, that's what you asked. Okay, that's right. So, Yeah. Close your eyes. <laughs> All right. There we go. So that's number two. And then, so you can quickly do a space. It gets tricky in the mechanical rooms because you got all the pipe and all the elevations and stuff, right? All the pipes in the way and everything. Yeah. So you got to go, so here you can do like, you know, bigger distances, eight, 10 feet in between. But then once you get into mechanical rooms, you got to start like just little movements, right? Because you want to really get around all the pipe and get those dimensions. So I can move it now and I can hit again with that scan. But uh, uh, see, the alignment issue is because there's people here. Yeah. We all moved. So we moved couldn't. around. Right? So that's why, like, unless it's like you were all just sitting at your desk and you were all just looking at your computers, then I could probably get away with it. But because we were all moving around and doing stuff, so the second one didn't align. Okay. Right? And that's where it gets tricky in more dense uh, spaces. Populated. To... That's why you go to the beach in the morning because nobody's there. Yeah, that's why I did it in the morning. Well, yeah. I did it also in the morning because it's not supposed to work. It doesn't work in sunlight. Yeah. Because uh, the light spectrum uh, plays with the. The lidar, right? It messes the signal up. So I went when it was like right, right at sun. I went four different four site visits to get that uh, beach, and I did it uh, at the same time, like right at sun, at, right at sunrise. Right or just no sunrise. So, so what is the effect of radius of the lidar? Uh, the effective. I would have to look that up for you because I don't. I like. I just wonder if you have like a big empty space. So if you have a big empty space, you have a different strategy than if you're just doing like a tight mechanical room, right? So to save time, you don't want to fill in all like the, like if it say it's a giant warehouse, you just rip around the perimeter, you get the perimeter, right? And then you, you could, if you wanted to, do a couple of zigzags, right? Or you can then, just to get some ideas, you can switch it to a 360 mode. And then you can embed just a 360 shot inside the model, mm -hmm. so you could, you know, move around the perimeter. And then you can go right. So there's there's different strategies. So when I first was when I was first doing the beach, I actually was like, okay, this is gonna take me. I'm, I'm gonna turn. I'll be like, I'll turn 50 soon. If I, I'm 47, by the way. So here's the beach. So that's how many scans I did to get it. So. Well, this was when I first started doing it because I didn't think that you saw how the uh, alignment issue was was it was an issue mm -hmm. right with us there yeah well, like on the east side of the beach you've got all the zigzag and on the west you just kind oh, of want okay. to go I switched to well I was surprised I, I switched to um, the the big open warehouse uh, method uh, doing this way and I just decided to go along and go for a run see how, how fast I could do this so I did this in like 
two days. I did this in like three days or whatever, whatever it was. But um, it took five days total, right? I think something like that. Yeah. Because it was 224 scans. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. So, but I was surprised because, you know, the, I was, the beach was always changing. Like, you know, the weather, the rocks are moving. So, you know, I was surprised that it, like, I was, I really didn't think it was going to work. Right. And then when I, when the, when I, when I got the first scan, so I would just leave this right here and I would just go back to the beach right now and I would just start 225. And you know, whether it connects or it doesn't connect, I don't know. Right? Yeah. You if you're lucky, it'll connect and you can continue it. Uh, yeah. But anyway, so that's it. Has everybody had a chance to experience the beach then? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. No, it's the mechanical room. Okay, now you're in the mechanical room. I was in, yeah, I would try the mechanical. You want to try, you try the mechanical first. Okay. It's good. That's good? Yeah, it's good. Nice. How much fun is that, eh? Yeah. I love it. Yeah, you can do urban exploration from your from your chair. Yeah. <laughs> you, don't well, have, you don't have to sneak into mechanical what, rooms. Here's here's the other thing to your question from earlier. Your um, What was your name again? Sorry. Five. Hmm? Five. Hi. Okay, cool. No, it's... <laughs> Sorry, it's Fari. It's F A H R I. Fari? Okay. Hi, hi Fari. Um, the other thing, too, is most mechanical rooms are not um, uh, wheelchair accessible, right? So there's another thing. You know, there, you have to like take an elevator up and then you got to take stairs, right? So it's pretty tough. And sometimes it's an obscure ladder into a very narrow. Oh, yeah. Thing. I love those ladders, you know? Yeah. yeah. I'm not a ladder fan. These really narrow ladders going through small yeah. openings, you know, with yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, so that's it. So it's all good fun. You know, 3D is uh, the way to go. You know, the 3D, what they call 3D computational computing or whatever. I don't know what the terms are, but yeah. it is definitely. Uh, and, and also too, like if you're if you're like a new, if you are a technical person in your service, and you get you get to be able to visualize the the, the space, all right? Like if you get to visualize the space first, then you'll be like, oh, that's a that's a one person job or that's a two person job. You know what I mean? Like, let's say for example, the valve I need to work on, I need to be on a ladder. Well, you, you know, they're not going to work on that on your own. But if it's down low where it's safe, then you might say, oh, I don't need to bring my ladder. So it's just, it, it really is like super convenient. All right, super fun, easy. Yeah, I'll move, I'll move for you. You can choose. Yeah, you can do your presentation as well. And then while you're while while you're setting up your presentation, everybody can get a chance to see the beach and the mechanical room, and also maybe the swim wave. Yeah, the swim wave is so cool. In the VR glass. Yeah. Oh, and so I don't know. I was saying about the weather. So if you want to set up your uh, yeah. computer oh, here. I was saying about the weather, sir. How it needed the mesh. Oh, what? It's this cable here, right? You can test it. Make yeah. sure do you it have Type C? I got it. Here we go. Uh, do you have a dock? A what? A dock. A dock. What's a dock? It's like, like a lo like a dock, a docking bay for it. Yeah. Oh, you don't have the. No. Oh, uh, now I see. Yeah. So can I borrow your computer? Oh sure, sure, no problem. Because it's online, right? So I'll just put my uh, Scott, if you want to do your hair, just you can pull that out and plug in this. This here. This is why I like VR. Like the what? This is why I like VR. See something that cannot display on the screen. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> Now, okay. The uh, usually, so I spend all my my time on my career you know, working design, like bidding and, and project managing and stuff. And the only way I really learned was by going to the website and then with the text. 
Firefox, I guess. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's cool as well. Oh, okay. And URL? Uh, I shared with you. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. So, let me see. Uh, when? When you share it with me? You can if I search Y Y I K A N. Uh, here. Which one? Presentation. Yeah, I think this. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Open. Perfect. And then let me go to displays. And we'll mirror the display. Let me. Ubuntu, I guess. Let me go over to displays. So I'm just going to. I think we're here. Good. All right. So we have our next speaker here. Big round of applause for Yi Ken. Ken. So you talk about real future past. So Scott, you'll like this. A little bit of summary of VR, state of the art in VR. Can I sit over here? Sure. Everybody, at least in this room, should know some, have some basic understanding to VR. So, what this plot is is the uh, development of PPD of VR glasses. The PPD stands for pixel per degree, which influences how clear um, we see inside the VR glass and how real we feel. So. Current VR industry, in my mind, mainly starts from 2016, and at that time, the PVD is only around 10. And the current most popular headsets is Meta Quest 2. It released in 2020, and it has a PPT for around 20. So. Pardon? Yeah, the Quest 2 is the one I have. Yes, it's what we have. It's also like this one. I put a small picture here. So when we have a 20 PPD, uh, we will have a relative clear image inside the VR glass. And uh, 
in 2022, uh, we get even better. So this is a part 5K AIO. It has uh, 32 uh, KVD, which is like even more clear. And uh, this is uh, Pimax Crystal. It's a very good and a premium Yeah, I will introduce this later. So as you can see, like, after six years, like development, and the clarity of your glass has like goes from ten to more than forty, almost like four times. Okay, so I put this uh, image to show you like the difference between 10 PVD comparing to 35 PVD and PVD and also comparing to like um, iPhone 4 screen this is like when you say iPhone 4 you cannot you basically basically don't see any pixels it's how dense the pixel is supposed to be and this is like at 2022 the best uh, VR's clarity and this is Quest 2's clarity. Mm. After using Quest 2, I think this is already very good and this will be so surprising. Okay. So, Bargo is going on like 70. Uh, which one? The Vargo has XR3. Vargo XR3 has over 70 PVD. Uh, it's, this is for I. It's like 35 PUD per eye. Per eye. Yes. So in total, it will be 70. But I think we already count as uh, how many PPD per eye. I see. So now uh, I want to introduce your uh, eight most popular or uh, just released uh, VR headsets because they are so much to talk about the state of art of VR technology. So I think if I can just introduce you some very popular headsets, it will like, make you to understand how the current VR is more clear. Mm. So in this slide, this, uh, in, my, uh, in my mind, there are two most popular headsets. In 2021, Quest 2 is sold for uh, more than 10 million, and this is the most popular headsets in China. So they are AIO headsets. So what AIO means is there are four cameras like on the sides of the headsets. So and uh, the controller has a ring, and this ring will emit infrared way, infrared light, and this light, we cannot see it, but the camera can see it. So the camera will use the light ring to check the controller. This is what uh, AIO means. We don't need, oh, and also it has a processor inside. So we, if we want to use it, we don't need to connect it to computer. It works as it works. It works like a Android phone, so it's very convenient to use. That's also why it's so popular. So it has pros like cast use stand alone, and also it's uh, relatively relatively cheap. This model is five hundred dollars, and Quest Two is like four hundred dollars, very affordable. Um, but they also have some. Uh, coins, they don't have a uh, very large FOB, they basically has like 90 degrees FOB. So when you wear it, you like wear a diving goggle or swimming goggle. It's not like I wear glass, I can see everything beside me. So this is not the state of art VR technology, but it's the current most popular te uh, VR technology. And these two, uh, these are current most popular PC VR. So 
the what PCBI is we need a computer to work with them. They don't have a chip inside. They need to connect to graphic cards to operate. Mm. So and so like they are not as user friendly as this kind because uh, graphic cards are expensive. But in on the other hand, um, uh, because they are PCBI, so they can have like uh, other features. They use uh, light stations. So we put the light station on the top of the room ceiling, and uh, it can achieve uh, 30, 360 degrees checking, even if you hide your controller behind you. If the light, if there is a light station behind you, the light station will see the controller. Also, for this particular controller, it's Bob Index. It's released in 2019, but it has the current market best finger tracking technology. So, if you use control, if you use this controller in VR, like um, half life apex, you can see your fingers movement. But as I said, these are PCBRs, so they are tethered, they are not as convenient as standalone AIO VR. Okay, so on this page, I will introduce two premium VR headsets. I believe they can stand for the current stage of the art VR technology. The top one is Vario, uh, is Vario Aero. So it's very expensive. It's released in 2021 with very, very high um, PPD. It's like 35 comparing to 20 super clear and the bottom one is Pimax Crystal it's just released uh, in June and will be available in the third quarter of this year it's also expensive and clear and I want to show you some uh, comparison photos in the next slide so basically this is how human eye will see the world very clear. And they say the whole Quest 2 Quest 2 image looks like. You can, as you can see, there is some grids on the image, and it is called a window gate of effect, I believe. So this is caused by the PPD is not high enough. And what um, Pimax Crystal improves is it has really high PPD, so it makes the image uh, almost seems as clear as we look at the human eye looks at the wall. Super clear. And uh, it's also a comparison between uh, Pimax Crystal and the current VR headset like Quest 2. As you can see, this image is a little blur, and this image is very clear. It's because the state of art VR technology implements new, um, new display lens. This lens allows the VR headset to have much clearer image display. Next one, I want to introduce Pico 4 and Opera 5KIO. Uh, Pico 4 is launched just a few days ago and uh, 
This one is Pico Neo 3, which is the last gen, and Pico 4 is the current gen. What it improves is that for this one, uh, it only supports black and white see-through. So if I wear it and I move around, and if I uh, want to see through, it's only black and white. And the Pico Neo 4 sports color for sales rules. So basically you can wear it and uh, go to supermarket to shopping, no problem. A Chinese YouTuber already did that. Yeah, and uh, also it supports, it also supports better lens. This lens is called Pancake Lens. What it does, it improves the uh, uh, clarity of the headsets and it can also reduce the weight and size of the headset. And on side, this is the Opera 5K AIO. It's not a, as popular as your headset. But uh, I want to introduce this because I ordered it. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's delayed for <laughs> half a year. <laughs> really Sorry. makes me upset. <laughs> but um, <laughs> This headset also has very high like PVD. It also has 35 PVD, and uh, it's relatively affordable. The only problem is it's delayed. There's just like limited release, or they're uh, just no. like it's completely uh, delayed. It's. Uh, I think they almost finished production. Well, this is a relatively small company, yeah. so they don't have that as strong like development develop, development force. Mm -hmm. So they met so many problems during like make the contro controller tracking mm -hmm. to work properly yeah. and to make the lens. Uh, lens color presentation looked cracked. A lot of problems to be solved, uh, so delayed for six months. And also it's a Kickstarter crowdfunding, so they don't need to ship it on time. Mm. So don't touch Kickstarter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah, th this is what's supposed to be look like inside a power 5k and this is the image inside plus two and this is the image you can supposed to be look like on a normal screen as you can see a power is much clearer than the clarity of this image is much clearer than quest tools and the clarity of the image inside a para and on the normal screen is very similar. So this kind of shows the development of the VR technology. This is two years ago and this is this year, current technology. So because the PPD is 32 versus 23? Yes, um, but not only the PPD, also for the lens. Oh. This use old lens and this use pancake lens. So the new pancake lens makes the image box more clear. And now to introduce some interesting VR yeah, accessories. This is a all direction running machine called um, uh, CAT VR Work C2. What you can do is you can tie yourself on the running machine and it's all directions 360 so you can run, jump, and uh, sit down or even swim on this running machine. It make you, it can help you to immerse in the VR world. How do you swim on it? Uh, just lean forward and just let your 
feet would like this. But you, you don't feel the wetness of the water, though, right? Uh, no, no wetness, but you can like do <laughs> the <laughs> swim. No resistance, yeah. little low resistance. Yeah. Uh, this is a catwalk, right? So it's like basically a dip and a slip on it, right? Yeah. Right. And uh, I, I actually think about like get one, but it's very expensive. Like it's it's like one thousand Canadian dollars for the machine and five hundred dollars for ship, uh, shipping to Canada. So I just look at it and uh, think, try to think about like I should not spend that much money on a on shipping. Yeah. yeah. By the way, I bought one of those balls that you go inside, and you can go inside the ball and run around. You stay in one place and run around inside the ball. If you're in water. Yeah, you just need a little space in the water. Or something. Yeah. And you just you run all around, and you can run for miles, and you actually stay in the same spot. So you have your VR headset, and you can go, you can run ten miles in virtual reality and still be in exactly the same spot. <laughs> to start. Well, yeah. However, huh? Is it easy to balance inside? Oh, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. I mean, like balance. Like, yeah, it's, it's fun. Steve's got good balance. He's a sub expert too. Yeah, yeah, it's a ball, and you go inside. The it's ball. transparent. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it doesn't I matter because you're in VR. With, but, hmm? I used to play with that. They're tough, right? It, yeah. It's hard. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I played that while playing, but it's balls that are big enough. Two meter diameter. Okay. It's two meter diameter. You put it on water. Yeah, you put it in a in a small pool. Or you can take it over the lake. Wait, but then how do you get enough air? Oh, there's enough air in there to last about maybe eight hours. Well, if you're running, wouldn't it get stuck here? No, no, you can run for a long time before you run out of air. There's quite a bit of air inside the ball. Well, you get accepted, right? Because you're also Not really, no. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it goes for a long time. Like, like, it's amazing how much air uh, can get inside that ball. If you compare that to your lungs, right? Yeah. And so how yeah. many air changes? Yeah, how many air changes do you get in the ball? Usually you go for a 10, a 10 or 15 minute run in the ball, but you could be in there a lot longer. But then how does the VR sensor know that so you're running? Uh, so what you do is you put mark, you put little markings on the ball and track them with computer vision so that as the ball turns, it's like a mouse, like an optical mouse. It turns, when the ball turns, it, it progresses the VR depending on which way the ball turns. Mm. So you can you can track it. I feel dizzy. Hmm? I feel dizzy. Oh, you were in the ball, right? No, no, no. You showed me the ball. Yeah. Did you go in it? No. No, you didn't try it. Yeah. Yeah. I brought it down to the beach a couple of times. Mm-hmm. You did. I only saw videos. Yeah. 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 I can bring it down if anyone wants to try it. You put the VR headset, and then. Um, and then and then you you just you run and run well, and run. But how about the VR headset get wet? No, you stay dry because you're in the ball. It's sealed. It's perfectly oh, okay. watertight. Great. It's a totally sealed uh, vessel. And it seems like it's much cheaper than this. But if you use a computer to track the dot, then you know you have a dot on the inside. How you just use a VR headset, built in camera? Absolutely. Camera. Yeah, you could just write it as an app for the VR headset to track the ball from the inside. You could do it inside or outside. Like another way to do it is to project on the ball from outside the ball and track it, and then you don't need to wear a VR headset. And the entire surface of the ball becomes a projection surface with several projectors around the outside of the ball. So you could do it inside out or outside in. Yeah. Uh, I guess next slide. So this is something even cooler. It's like haptic clothes and haptic gloves, but they are super expensive. Even more expensive than the running machine. And yeah. I have never tried them on, but it seems like cool. Like, if you use this to play some, I guess, swim game, you will feel like you uh, swim in something, I guess. And for this, you can feel the haptic and force and uh, probably temperature change. Hmm. Yep. 
but they are like thousands of dollars. So not they are too big not to say. We are still letting me very well, right? So you can sense those creeps out. Right? Yeah. You can put the hand in the water and they give us. Uh no, stuff. they are not waterproof, but I mean if if you download the app again, let's say, and you are swimming in a water a pool. And would you have that kind of sense? Yeah, you will possibly. feel like, I, I guess, it's probably like, it will make you feel like the water is goes through you by the haptic, by the haptic sensor. Well, it's got uh, haptic like motors that all around you. So if uh, in a game you are hit here, on this side, you will feel it. If you are hit here at the back, you will also feel it. It's very cool. So at this time, um, I want to introduce the uh, Gartner Hype Cycle. So what this curve shows is a train of a new emerge technology. At the beginning, like, the innovation triggered and after that it just burst and then it were, people were realized it's not virtual enough so it dropped down and after a while after there are enough techno technology deposit it will like gradually go back up and going to like production and uh, I try to fit this curve with the current VR industry uh, and I believe like the first stage is between 1950s and uh, 20, uh, 2010s. And uh, when the time approach to 2015, we get our like, basically the first generation of um, customer level VR, like PSVR, HTC Vive Pro, and Oculus Rift. So it's the first peak of the VR headsets. But at that time, the PPD were very low. So people found uh, the VR is not about reality. It's very, it was very, very fake. So they lose the, uh, the belief to VR headsets. So the trend just go down. and. Uh, when time arrived at 2020, uh, Facebook or Meta re released their Quest 2, and uh, at this time the PT goes like high enough, and uh, the price is more acceptable, more acceptable, and they, they are user friendly because they, can, they don't need a high-end PC to work with the VR. So people think now the VR industry actually start. So the trend goes up and uh, after Quest 2, other tech companies believe they, it's the time they go into VR. So they also release their past sets like Pico News 3 or Pimax Crystal. And uh, I think the, the current VR industry will still keep going and uh, Right now, at 2022, it's only the start of VR. Mm -hmm. Also, there are a lot of like aspects of VR, not only about the VR headsets, however, also about software, like interaction, accessories, and counter applications. So I don't have a lot of time to go through everything. So I just want wants to talk about my experience with the software interaction and the application, which is um, on Monday, uh, I was in Prof. Min's workshop and used MetaPod to take a few 360 photos and uh, put them together to form a 3D space and experience and we can experience the 3D space in VR headset. It's very cool. But because it's my first time I use Metapod, 
I found there are some problems. Uh, I guess I can go through them if it works. Maybe load it into the eyeglasses and pass the eyeglasses around. Uh, I want to like talk about some problems I met. Yeah, yeah. No, but at some point you can show the the uh, the swing, the wave too on the eyeglass, right? Yeah, of course. I just uh, I forgot where the link is, so I, I cannot load it to the. You, glass. you need the oh, link. Scott, I... you send send him the link. I can send it here. You trade it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just email him the link from the because uh, you have it. Uh, yeah. You put it in. Uh, actually, you've got the annotated version too, which is kind of nice. So just email it to him, and then. That's just a video. Yeah. It's a 3D model. That's just a low res video. Yeah. So. No, we'll get you. Just give me a second. Mm. Okay, so basically, the problem I met is because we only like take 360 photos along this side, so the model is only built according to this coordinates. So when I try to stay there, or I look at there, it's like nothing there. So the model is not complete. We need to take more photos to make this room feel like a real room. It's always a trade-off, though. It depends on where you want to be able to go, right? So yeah, but so if you want to only be explore around where the wave is, it's the reason we took the. Yeah, but uh, right now. If we look at the 3D model, we will say it's like just some bones on this side, and uh, outside this side, outside this space, there's nothing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, what? Actually, put it on the on the headset and show everybody what the problem is. That's probably the best thing, so that everybody yeah. understands what the shortcoming is. Yeah. Uh, it's actually easier to show it on the screen. So I can point to you like we do both from. and then we can compare yeah yeah do both yeah yeah and then compare do it on the screen uh, and then do it on the headset I emailed you emailed me yes um, oh you don't have your computer probably yeah. oh and I emailed Steve oh okay. okay okay so why don't I um you know, hold this for a second we're still going live here um, and uh, so I will let me go here and then. Um, what's the big terminal here? I should learn Linux from your problem. Yeah, it's always a good idea to step outside the holding cell, you know? Yes. Spending your whole life in jail isn't really the best way to go about learning about. Yeah. That's what I do find is that is that a lot of people are in the uh, there it is. Now let me just go back to here again. Okay. Is that Firefox you run? Yeah. Oh. Huh. Because uh, it works great, eh? Where did it go? Uh, that's still the mechanical thing. Oh, is that mechanical? I thought oh. oh, I sent you two emails. Okay. So that I sent you that one. Uh, but I just sent you. Okay, I'll go back again to my Gmail. Oh. And I got an email from Scott here. And yeah, what? the most recent one. Yeah, that'll be it. And then what I'll do is I'll. Right. First, 
yeah. the show like sound seems really cool. <laughs> it's like hide inside here. Like it's a old Apple PC. Apple two, yeah. Yeah, it's a real one. Yeah, I bought that in nineteen seventy eight. Yeah, first time I see a real one. And it still works. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's really cool. That's crazy. Okay, so. <clears throat> and it boots it instantly. It boots faster than any other computer that exists in the world, I think. Uh huh. What's the memory size? 48K. 48 48K? Yeah. K? Yeah, that was the maximum. Normally it was 16K. But I thought you said gig. I was like, what? No, 16K of memory rate com comes with normal, and okay. then we maxed it out at 48K. So here is the problem. Oh, okay. There are like two problems. The first one is I. It's the first time I use this, so I didn't re realize what will happen if I don't mark the mirror. Yeah. Which I didn't. Mm -hmm. So it, it makes sound like. Yeah. It make it make up some not exist room like inside the mirror. So that's the <clears throat> so what I was doing with the light. Yeah. They call the the these these cameras vampires. They don't like mirrors or sunlight. <laughs> yeah. Right. So. Yeah. What, yeah. What, what's what's wrong with mirrors? It 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 reflects. It, 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 it reflects. The, the it thinks there's another room. Yeah. Thinks it's another room and it messes with the alignment. Mirrors, windows, and light, and sunlight. Yeah. yeah. And bright light. Um, how fast you can say like here's nothing. Like, I knew because when I was looking yeah, at it. Was, yeah, yeah. Like if we want to have a proper 3D model, we need to make a full room. So just for look nicer, like the people can show can see your workshop. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we need to like take a few more photos, I guess. Yes, is that, that, yeah, so the, you, you fill the space, you fill it all up, right? And then you go around, I go a little denser around whatever objects that I really want to grab, uh, but then I, I complete the space and then, then you have to go in and edit, put the windows, put the mirrors, mark the mirrors. So I, what I started doing was because if I, if I do the outside, I'm, I'm doing it outside and I'm on the edge of a roof, right? I was like, well, how am I going to figure that out? So then I just started marking the edge of the roof like it was a window, yeah. and then it boxed it in for me. Yeah. So it's like a nice little box, right? So it takes it the model, right? Or, or, or it does that. It just, all these shots, right? It's like in every direction. Going like off the edge of the roof. Going off the edge of the roof, yeah. So yeah, then. So you box, you said the edge of the roof is a mirror or a window. A window. Yeah. And then I, and I, yeah, and then I was inside. I, I can show you one if you want, but yeah, so what it looks like, because I'm completely outside and I'm not supposed to be outside. Now, the funny thing is with going at sunrise, I didn't have that bleeding, all those crazy, like those lines that are happening there. Yeah. That would happen with a mirror. Yeah. That's why it was pretty exciting. I was like, oh, they figured. It worked pretty good. That beach turned out really good without having to box it in. I didn't box it at all. Yeah. 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 But I, the trick was going every day when the, the weather conditions were the same. And See, the when you go in here, it, as long as you stay in that model, as long as you stay close to the wave, uh, as long as you don't uh, walk away from the wave, because it gets pretty wonky when you You cannot away. walk away from the wave, basically. If you stay right up against the wave, it's not bad, right? Well, yeah, yeah but like, like when we go into the model, we have to stay with the wave, so it looks good. But yeah, why yeah, stay yeah. outside? We want to look the overview. Of it. Like you walk around that wave, it looks good. But that's all we were shooting. We just shot the wave. We didn't shoot yeah. uh, further away. We just shot the wave. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And also, uh, while I try to align the photos, I found it's really hard. Like, mm. Every time I, because we use uh, rulers uh. to measure the measure each point we take photos so why i tried we planned it all out we measured them like we we did them in one foot increments exactly along the one side of the rail yeah and then we moved exactly 24 and a half inches back and then did another set in one foot increments all the way along the back behind yeah. the wave 
always facing the same direction yes. the camera well, the camera face yeah the camera is always facing the same direction okay and i upload the huh. photos and try that's cool try to align them but the algorithm believes it's very smart and helps me mess up with my lineup how so how how do you physically align the 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 360 that camera it's insta 360 yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, how do you how do you physically line that up? That's that's interesting. Uh, what do I mean? When you were talking about the alignment. Yeah. So when you're when you take a photo. Yeah. And then you take another photo. Yeah. And so, but you know how I showed you in my example, how I moved it, and then it, yeah. then it would go ooh when, scan when, when, scan two, but then I can move it in anywhere around that, but with what you're doing, what so how, describe to me how you did that. Okay, so we have a original spot. So that's the first image we upload. Yeah. And uh, inside the app, there is a rough coordinate system will appear after we upload the first photo. Is that part of the app of Insta360? Oh no, this is a metapod. So when you upload the first photo, it will appear a rough coordinate. Oh yeah, that was the oh. other thing that we oh. had to do. We had to decide whether we want to use the app the Matterport app to aggregate the pictures or just shoot them and upload them into Matterport afterwards. And we decided it was too hard to work within the app because the app's so finicky. Like it, what we did is we put an image, grabbed an image and then Matterport would say, take the next one. And then maybe it didn't line up and we'd have to delete it and then try again. Whereas what we did instead is we just shot the images outside Matterport and then uploaded them one at a time into Matterport, like picked out the better ones, take the ones that turn out best and upload them into Matterport one at a time. So you didn't do every foot? You well, we did upload, every foot, but, you, but sometimes it didn't turn out so well and we redid some. Yeah. So, so we looked at the picture and redid back, it. Because that's a big problem with Matterport. Like, so say, say when I, I invested all this time and I, you know... I, Matterport software is so badly written. Yeah. It's such a pain to use. I want to spend less time inside Matterport. So with the, with the, with the capture, with the capture, right? Uh -huh. uh, with the capture app, if you... Say you misalign it, it'll give you a warning. Yeah. Oh, but well, like, uh, I did some that were like seven, seventy five hundred. Too feet, far away, yeah. Seventy five hundred square feet, or it just um, doesn't line up. It was that older building, yeah. And then it says, "Oh, you may have alignment issues. May move them closer." And I had to go back and do an entire, an entire, uh, uh, like another seventy five uh, hundred foot, and it was like all these little rooms and stuff. So what we'd do is shoot a bunch of pictures and try uploading them. And then we could take some more if we need to, you know what I mean? Like, but with it outside the Matterport app. And also, when you use Insta360, even if you take photos inside the app, the picture is always there. That's true. When you delete it from Matterport, it's really just delisting it from Matterport. You still have the picture oh. on the camera. It doesn't actually delete it, which is fortunate. On the camera or in the app or uh, uh, outside, outside the app. Yeah, outside app, so you can basically upload it by yourself. It's really interesting that you took individual photos and uploaded them. How long did that take to do that? That's it's so cool. Uh, like, it takes me like three minutes to upload photos in total, but it takes me like two hours to align them because yeah. I need to use my finger or use like the touch sensitive pen to pull each photo to align them and every time I align them together if the algorithm believes it's not aligned properly it will like slightly change the alignment is that the what, is that the software that you have listed on there that you're using for the alignment um, it's on the list there it's a uh, uh, this oh and this is another point so there are a few com um, competitors in the market with Matterport? Yeah, we found two open source uh, competitors to Matterport. And I think it's worth exploring those because uh, free open source, two different ones. We should, uh, uh, maybe we can all try those. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we can try those two other competitors mm -hmm. and see like the three of us or the four of us, or whoever you want to join, if you guys want to all join on this, what we're going to try and do is see if we can create superhuman vision, superhuman machines, vision machines. And, and cyborg technology using this open source replacement because then 
imagine if you could just swim in the lake and then it generates a model, you know, and then you've got this beautiful 3D model of the rocks under the water and you could mark hazards. And then when you swim, you could have hazards that warn you for getting too close to rocks. So on a clear day, you could record where all the rocks are. And then when it's rough and you can't see in there so well, you could know where the rocks are by the virtual model, assuming they don't move because they move around every once in a while, but give you an approximate location. Okay, was, uh, yeah, like put it into a 3D model that's not Matterport. Why, why would you? Why would need a 3D model in that case? Why can't we just use AR and just mark it? Yeah, yeah that's what I mean. Well, AR, that is a 3D model then. No, I mean, like, we can just use a GPS coordinate to mark where the rocks are, right? Yeah, but you need really accurate GPS. Like, I think a combination of vision and GPS is going to be better than GPS alone. The rock is like, your only means of locating yourself would still be via GPS. No, you can locate yourself with vision above the water and then use that information to see what's below the water. So suppose you have a boundary problem where there's a surface of water, yeah. and then suppose that you build a, a, well, not Matterport, but the open source equivalent model above and below the water, and they're perfectly registered. You could use vision of objects above the water to know where you are below the water. So you would know where the rocks are in relation to things that are visible above the water. So like, there's not really any landmark or anchor points above water. Right? Oh, there's lots of landmarks, like there's TE-22 that always stays in the same spot. So um, the laneway those, marker, there's trees. Accurate, I'm just thinking how accurate The beach itself. Those landmarks will be able to provide you, you know, how, the accuracy of these landmarks. TE-22 is a pretty accurate landmark. We use that for a lot of our... Is that this season? I don't know how, like, where it is. It might move season. later and we'll have to redo it, so but... You're, you're yeah. saying you're, you'll be using your camera, in a sense, right? So I, using your camera, I get the question. I'm, I have my, I'm having a little heart, like, a trouble, like, wrapping my head around it. I kind of see you, see where you're coming from, because the, the, the surface changes depends on the, the, the water, the, like, the weather conditions, right? Yeah, like so, those times, like today, it was really visible. You could see everything. So today I would build a map of where all the hazards are yeah. and then index that into the above the water. Like we do that manually without using the glass. Like I say, mm -hmm. uh, the red railing, okay? So I say if you go, Cheetah's Rock, you know, where like that is, if you go out yeah. the red railing, I know it's a little to the left of the red railing. Yeah. So if it's stormy, I know that, che I still know where Cheetah's Rock is in relation to the red railing. Cheetah's Rock, yeah. So, so you need to have a very accurate gyroscope and make sure the camera doesn't have any contortion in order to be able to... No, I just need to be able to see above water, like I, uh, without any a, a vision aid at all, just with my own human vision. I know roughly where Cheetah's well, Rock is on a stormy day. you actually doing the scanning of the water? Yeah, so if you scan under the water and then you mark where the hazard is, and then I need to somehow tell my machine where I am. So how do I tell the machine or the model where I currently am? Uh, basically, when you put up the top, take your first picture, it will form a coordinates. And uh, so that's a GPS. No, that's so, vision. You saw his camera. That wasn't GPS. When you move that camera, it knows how far it is based on the camera. It's so the same as our I model. The beach, I come back again. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's not, if the rocks move around, you're in trouble. But he did that on over five days. You come back to the beach, and f we call that a video orbit, right? Oh, you're in the same so orbit. If you read that, read that paper, video orbits. Search, do a search on video orbits, and search that concept. So you're in the same orbit. Like what happens if you come back, yeah. and the conditions are still the same? You can get into the same orbit, and as long as you can right. get into that orbit, you can move around, add to it. I have an but, airport. Yeah. But if, if something happens, there's a really vicious storm and it stirs up the beach and moves all the pebbles around, you might not be able to get back into the same orbit. Yeah. That's, and, that's and, then, and then you're out of luck. You can't add any more to the orbit. You're done. But, but if you are in the same orbit, you can either add to the orbit or you can go back and index into it and use it for vision to locate hazards. Hmm. I guess because it's also using the 3D... It's 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 using it's using that that feedback, right? From the lighter from Yeah, which wouldn't really work on visual landmarks above surface of water because it's so far away, right? Uh, the coordinates is the based on I don't know, you know parallax, you know when we swim, we always know where we are because 
like I look at the parallax, there's still quite a bit of parallax. Like when you swim out past TE22 or, or yeah. out towards yeah. the Toronto Island, like I know if I'm halfway to the Toronto Island because I can see parallax. You can still see stuff moving. Like you look at buildings and there's other buildings that are moving behind them. So there's still parallax. I know where I am in three dimensional space because let's say this building lines up with that building over there and you keep swimming and you can see yeah, that building it moves. It starts to shift and the, yeah, the foreground, middle ground, background. There's all these buildings change. right down on the waterfront, all those condos. And then behind them, there's another row of buildings over on, uh, yeah. uh, where are all the tall buildings? A lot of them are in the bank district, right? Like the, the bank, yeah, financial, financial yeah, district. Financial. So there's, so there's all the, the condors, right, condos right down on the waterfront and then way back in the financial district, there's another row of buildings. And when you swim along, you can definitely see parallax. So if I have like a virtual glasses on while I'm swimming, so how does my glasses know, right? So I'm imagining the glasses has some sort of camera on there, right? And I turn around, I see the TV, and I have a gyroscope built in, and I turn around, I see another landmark over there, I calculate the angle, maybe that tells me where I am. Well, you see landmarks behind other landmarks. You're really looking for parallax. I notice, like when you're, when you want to know if there's a current, right? You know how sometimes we swim to, like over to the TE-22 and you have a hard time coming back? Yeah. Well, how do we know that we're having a hard time coming back? How do you know if there's a strong current and you're going against it? Well, you know there's very little change in parallax. You know, have you ever found some days you swim like mad and you're not inducing much parallax? Yeah, yeah. So you're always looking for parallax to make sure you're making progress because otherwise you could be swimming really hard and going nowhere, right? You're just in the same spot, yeah. And the way you know that is by the lack of parallax change. Mm. So you're looking at the 3D structure of things. You inherently do that. Like good swimmers know if they're in a strong current yeah. based on the 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 absence or the of or the rate of change or the, the reduction, right? Which is also memory that they yeah. have, right? Yeah. So when they're in current, when they're swimming in the same pot and there's no current or there's little current versus yeah. higher current. Yeah. So they have that that also that rate of change. That, that's I think that's what's probably more right. It's inherently innate, like like you know, uh, um, you can kind of see if you're getting closer to things or not, and where things are in three dimensional space. So if you can look around and understand where you are three dimensional, like I could say, if I'm swimming around, I might look over there, I look at this uh, the utility pole here, and there's another building there, and another building behind that building, yeah. and I can say, oh, where's Cheetah's Rock? Like, I should be able to ask my computer, where's Cheetah's Rock or where's the other rock? Tell me where the rocks are right now, yeah. based, and it'll be able to warn me. Like, I could put virtual buoys there, you know, those danger rocks buoys, those, those white yeah. buoys? Yeah. I could have those appear virtually where all the rocks are. So if you yeah, really try perfect. to locate ourselves with only the landmarks and rather parallax, would, then, would that be accurate enough? I'm just not quite sure. sure. It's easier to do than yeah, well, GPS works to some degree, but it's not totally accurate. So I think my theory anyway, which I think we could easily confirm this, but vision plus GPS is going to be better than GPS alone. That's what I was going to say. If you start to add on layers, plus also if you also have the lake bed, like, you you know, we always just do a focus on the on the on the on the water surface, like kind of what you were saying, but that we have the information. Oh, I'm just doing this stream. Does anybody have a have a USB C cable? I can charge my. I just want to charge my phone oh, and keep it running. I, I got a power bank, but I just need a USB C cable, I'm USB C sure. cord for it. Oh, I'm not sure if it uh, will work. Oh, perfect, perfect. But, but it's USA to say, so I'm not sure. If yeah, plug that into here. That's so rad. You guys took the pictures right in there. and uploaded them and stitched them by hand. That's so cool. There. Now I'm still going. Now you're going. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, probably my last point. Like some pros and cons are. Like cons. Yeah, that's a good. That would be a good way to. to um, yeah. Pros and cons of Matterport. Yeah, okay. So yeah. First, here. <laughs> pros like it has the best. Uh, one is generally a model. It has the best like best looking and. Uh, most features in the current industry so and it's uh, the most popular app so if you want to do 3d like visual tour math is supposed to be your first choice but it still has some coins which is <clears throat> for its competitors 
we can upload uh, 360 photos to computer and uh, edit it uh, on the web. Mm -hmm. But for Metapod, we can only edit it in on the phone. So it's not very convenient. That's why I try to pull and align the photos. It's practice. Yeah. My finger is so thick. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, the thing is, the S22 has a pen, but the S21 will work with the S22 pen, so you just have to buy the pen. <laughs> uh, it will work, but yeah, but it's not very convenient. Yes. And the other thing is, this app only, the Metapod app only works on some phones. Like I have Huawei Mate 40 Pro and uh, Honor Mate 4 Ultra. Just Meta, Metapod does not support this brand phone. It doesn't support the P40. It does support the P30 though, right? I don't think so. Like oh. on my on the Mac 4 Ultra, like it has a mock system based on P30 and still the doesn't same work. Because yeah. yeah. that was it my last phone as a P30 Pro. Because it was uh, it was strictly Apple when they first when they first yeah, released. Yeah, they no. were completely 100% Apple, and then they went then they went public. I think. Yeah, I like on Monday, I was so mad about the alignment. I was thinking about get get a Apple, uh, iPad mini 6 and Apple Pen to do the alignment. So you had to physically do the alignment using, you, but you did your own alignment or you did it? I did my own alignment because the uh, auto alignment just messed up everywhere. So uh -huh. when I upload the first image, it will appear a very rough like one meter or uh, like 10 meter grid coordinate. Mm -hmm. So according to this coordinate, I align every single photo based on like, based on some distance estimation. Beautiful. Yeah. I'm just wondering really because the Insta360 does not have a built-in lighter and um, it is dark environment, right? Um, we do long exposure. Right, but like- That's a really good question. Fun. That's a, that's a great question. I, that's what I wanted to, I, I was surprised because, uh, you know, like with the WebXR, uh, with the apps that you can attach into with the point cloud data and you can attach it to the mesh, the 3D, the 3D data. Yeah. Right. So the, the matter tags, um, you know, uh, they don't work at least I haven't tried it recently, but they don't work if I, I can just use my camera and, and do 360. Right, I don't have it in the scanning mode, so it's just yeah. taking the 3D 60 photo. Um, but then I can't attach those tags. I can't. I can't annotate. I can't do anything with it. Yeah. So that's why I tried when I when I, I was surprised to see it was actually uploaded on under my account. So I was like, that was cool. So then, but then I went. And I immediately tried. And I was able to attach a tag to it. Right. So I think it's. Uh, it's like trying to put a square peg in a round hole or a round <laughs> hole, a square peg. Just be, and, and the fact that you were able to do it is so cool. Like, I mean, like that's, that's amazing that you did that, like that you actually figured that out and, and you actually got it accomplished because it looks, it looks great, yeah. right? So I just hope like I can edit this on web. So it's probably way much easier. You know, you know what I was thinking? Uh, what would be fun to do, I, I got this idea, and we might be able to do it better with the open source version replacement rather than Matterport. Um, what I want to do is buy a whole bunch of Insta360 cameras yeah. and mount them all around the room yeah. and then be able to do portraits, VR portraits, where somebody comes in and we push a button and they all take a picture at the same time. Yeah. They all do it like a five or ten second exposure simultaneously and we have the swim go around, the wave goes around, and then and then they all grab it and they all go into Matterport and pre-align them. So the, cause the alignment won't change. The cameras are always going to be the same place. So we only should only have to do that alignment once. And then any new set of images, we take a new picture and use the same alignment each time. So what, fix the cameras in the room. So the cameras don't move instead of taking one camera and moving it around, duh, duh, yeah. duh, just to get a whole bunch of cameras and mount them like maybe hanging from the ceiling. So they're kind of like this. Uh -huh. Oh, so we, so when you're doing your swim, yeah, you can and different doing different waves. 
Yeah. You can always capture them in 3D. Yeah, and then what I'll do uh, is I'll say I don't really care about the whole room because yeah. I'm not interested in way over there. It's just like if you, you know, like when you're doing uh, your yeah, mechanical yeah. room, I say I don't care about that chiller way over there. I just yeah. want to kind of be able to walk around this area. Yeah, that's right. yeah. So I'll define a small box where people can walk around where the swim wave is. So I'll just go I'll mount cameras around where the wave form is. And that's it. You're just in this little box. And then when you put on the VR headset, you can walk around and explore the wave. Now, you won't be able to walk way over and look at the, at the, down to the kitchen so in the house. I wonder if you would want to make, build it all the way around. It's all the way around going, the wave, yeah. Like, so it's going right through, so it's going through the cameras. Yeah, so like have a, have a gauntlet of cameras on either side. Not even, but maybe on four axis, or like on, like on like two per axis, or even... Uh, it's so basically two axes in a shoot like each camera shoots three hundred and sixty degree angle. It's like in one go. Sphere. But three sixty is like if I'm pointing my camera at the at the wave, three sixty is like this way too. Because yes. Yeah, so but it's, it's curving it's curving away, no? It it well it shoots four pi radians of solid angle. Okay. Or one spat. Right. Yeah. If you like British units of measure, okay. one spat is equal to four pi star radians. So will it capture the the full, or will it, it captures light from all angles? Yeah. Okay. So so I just mount these from the ceiling hanging down. On on uh, around the room, like 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 I could just make a make a like imagine this is my room here. Maybe I have this this. This uh, this desk here, so that they're coming down from the ceiling, to two, three, four, and they're just fixtured there. Mount them kind of yeah. semi permanently, hanging from the ceiling, and then another row over here, and another row over there, and another row over here, or something, so that. So you're you, going you're going fully around it, or you're just going. No, the cameras are just surrounding it, and then you bring people into the room, and you say, okay, we'll do a portrait of you, and then I could have somebody, I could seat somebody here like this, and say, okay, sit down here on this chair and hold still for five seconds. And then I push a button, it does a five second exposure while the swim goes across. Uh -huh. And then do a VR portrait. Because, you know, like, like this way we could bring in various people like Margaret Atwood or somebody like that and do a VR portrait. Uh -huh. People could come into this VR portrait studio, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, and on the Prof Ming did a really good job at hiding himself. <laughs> <laughs> Was wearing all black and it was a dark room. <laughs> like I, I wore like white shirts, so I had to go away, but he can stay there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's an art to hiding to doing a bacography. If you search for a bacography, uh, like you'll see like how to do these pictures and and like the art of sort of hiding into the shot. Is to is to well, the way you move through the space too, right? Is you don't linger too long in any one spot. So when you push the swim along, you know, like when you push the the rail along, you start like this, and you you know you you always pull pull that down low, and you know you go like this, and get your hands hiding right, and then uh, like this so that your hands are not visible. And if you have a black enough shirt, like this shirt, like you want a really, really black shirt and black, really black pants, and pull everything down tight, and then you keep moving so you don't leave a trace. So when you put that swim across, like if this is the swim rail here like this, if you're sliding that across, so if you're going to move this, you start when you start the exposure, you start moving, and then you slide it across like this, and then you keep on moving so that you're never in the same spot for too long to cast a shadow. Because you don't want shadows. You can hide. But you don't also don't want to leave ghost shadows. So it's like your invisible cloak. You yeah, see, so you got this <laughs> invisible cloak, and then you just keep moving your body mm -hmm. um, uh, consistently. You don't you yeah. don't hesitate. So the scope will reach the end of the swim rail, and then you yeah. just keep moving yourself even after the scope stays. Because I like to pause the scope at the end of the rail so it becomes visible. You notice you can see the little bit of the oscilloscope sitting there at the yeah. end of the rail. Yeah. Because I let it sit there for a second, each time. Uh, each picture, yeah. I let the oscilloscope rest at the end of the rail for a few seconds so that it's visible, but I kept myself moving while I was resting it. So I'd slide it along and then it would pause, it would reach the end of the rail, and then I just kept on moving like this, you know, to hold it there. Oh, so you were there, oh, that's funny. Yeah, so, so I, I, I was invisibly in all, all of the pictures. That is, uh, that's funny.
cross means always there. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, yeah. So that's pretty much it. Yeah. Really yeah, it was really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the other thing I want to show you guys is is the motor, uh, like the, the 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 motor. Yeah. So I've got this this magical motor, and 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 let me let me start with a kind of philosophical framework. It's sort of you can say that the Earth goes around the Sun, or the Sun goes around the Earth. I mean, Albert Einstein said, you know, all things are relative, and there's no preferred inertial frame of reference, and all that. You put your coordinates wherever you want to. You know, you can I can say that the uh, it's just the math changes, right? And it maybe becomes more complicated. If you like to say that all the planets go around the Earth, then the math becomes a little bit more complicated because you've got to account for retrograde motion. And you add a few more terms to the harmonic series, as the ancient Greeks did, uh, with their computation of celestial bodies, location, and stuff like that. So we've got this kind of relativity kind of thing here. I've got this motor here. You can see the motor here. There's a pulley at the end of that shaft of the motor right there. Can you guys see the pulley? Motors have a pulley on them because they usually turn a belt or something or to provide some motion. So what you can see here is this pulley would normally provide a belt, but what I've done is I've screwed this pulley to this case. So I'm asking this motor here to turn this road case. So when the motor begins to turn, it's going to turn that case. And then, since the case is attached to the table, the motor is going to turn the table. And since the table is attached to the floor, the motor is going to turn the floor, and the floor is attached to the building, so the motor is going to turn the whole building. And in some sense, the motor is going to turn the whole universe. So that motor is set up so that it will spin the whole world around it. And upon the motor is these uh, sequential wave and printing machines three of them a red one and a green one and a blue one one for each of the three phases of this three phase variable frequency drive motor so we'll see a vfd in action in a way that maybe you might not have seen it before unless you've seen this machine this is one of my inventions from my childhood so some of you may have seen it or read about it or something but there it is now i'm gonna now this motor is going to turn so now what's happening is the whole world is turning around and you can see that actually somebody want to want to maybe um well, well we'll try it here with the lights some light on and then we'll, we'll we'll darken the light so you can see it better but if everybody can understand it now you can see there that now i can see the rotating magnetic field of the motor frozen in space because it's as if i'm an ant sitting on the shaft of the motor turning with it and in this way, I'm in a set of coordinates in which the speed of the motor rotation is exactly zero. So I'm spinning with the motor, and therefore the whole world is turning and I'm standing still. And so it's like, if I, it's sort of, I can say I'm, I, I'm on the earth and the sun goes around the earth, or the earth goes around the sun. It's equally correct to say that um, uh, I'm spinning the whole world and the motor standing still, or the motor's turning around and the world's standing still and I'm in the coordinates of the spinning motor. And so what that does is it works the same as swim. The way swim, one way to think about how swim works is you're traveling at the speed of light along with it or the speed of sound along with it and the wave propagation speed is zero because you're moving along with it. Yeah. So it's sort of freezing, shearing the space-time continuum in just the right way that the speed of wave propagation is zero. Here we're just the construct is in just the right way that the speed of rotation of the motor is zero. And so we're sitting still. And that's why and how you can see these waves on the swim motor. And so if you want to try that, what I'll suggest is hold this so that it doesn't move. But be careful. Don't put your fingers out here. We'll look at caught in the spinning um, uh, swims. Put your hand here to hold it. Uh, and then grab onto this handle here. Grab further out. Don't don't stick your fingers out to the swims. Like when you're turning the crank, don't stick your finger out like this and get caught in the swim like that. You want to keep your fingers back inside. Don't be, you know don't do this. So keep your fingers all back behind this steel washer, and you can crank it, and then you can experience and see and understand what swim is. So everybody can try that, and then I'll do a, do a picture for you if you want. I'll turn off the lights and do a picture so that each person can experience this, this sequential wave and printing machine, the swim. So try it. Put one hand on here and turn it with the other hand while you watch the 
waveform, and you can see that VFD, variable frequency drive, um, how it doesn't matter how slow or fast you spin it, it stays still because you're turning with it. You're turning yourself and the whole world around the motor. Or another way to think about it is that you're you're like an ant on the on the on the on the uh, shaft of the motor spinning with the world. So it cancels out the effect of that. Does everybody want to give that a spin? Give that a try. Fast, I can go like fast as you want. If you go too fast, it'll start to clip, uh, and I can turn it down. If you want to go really fast, I can turn down the gain a little bit. But you can see that. See human vision. You can see and photograph that rotating electromagnetic field, or the rotating magnetic field of that motor. It's very visible. You can see it. And wouldn't it be nice if you could walk into a mechanical room and in virtual reality, see exactly that coming out of each of the, uh, out of each of the, um, I guess, I don't know what, well, we could ask him what he's looking for. I don't have the key to the cabinet, though. Because my T-card is in these cabinets, that's why. Yeah, I don't have the key to the cabinet. Do you know who does or how I can contact them? I'm not sure I'm the professor for this class, but there's a different professor probably for that cabinet. Do you remember the name of the other professor? Mario Butler. Oh, okay. So, yeah, contact your professor, I guess. Yeah, but he wasn't here this ah. year. Yeah, so you can see so how that... you're spinning the... Instance, instead of this, this fixed and it's rotating, you're rotating the motor. Yeah, yeah. Ah. So the whole motor body turns. That is brilliant. And, it, and therefore, it allows you to see the rotating uh, magnetic field within that motor. Which then you could analyze. <clears throat> well, you could analyze everything, basically. I mean, everything that we do in buildings is rotating electrical devices, like compressors and motors, right? Yeah, yeah. Nice. So the position of the lead depends on speed. Are yeah. You? Okay, so, so when you spin it faster, it generates more voltage, and okay, uh, and when you spin it a little bit faster, it generates a little bit more voltage. Oh, so this LED is uh, uh, powered are, by the sine waves of the. Uh, Those are the waveforms. Yeah, waveforms of the motor world. Actually, okay, we should connect a light bulb by. So you, you superimpose that on the rotation, looks like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and Prof, can we use the generator electricity to power on the LED? Yeah. So 